are back with our panel, Jim Thorne and Robert Kafsik. And on the fact that they have pushed out when they expect to increase or when they expect to hit their inflation targets, is that not hawkish? I know you said earlier that maybe we're done at 5%. Why would we be done if we're not going to hit inflation target, if we're going to hit inflation target six months later than we thought? Well, because I think policy today is restrictive enough, and they probably sense that, doesn't necessarily mean they're 100% done. If we continue to see data like we, th well, like we saw through the spring, uh, they very well could come off and move again. But I think at this point, uh, we are restrictive enough. So with respect to their forecast, I mean, it just, it looks like to the Bank of Canada, there is just more sting power in the economy, not only through the first half of the year, which overshot their expectations from the last NPR. But even into the third quarter, I think they're penciling in like one and a half percent growth. And that's when the bank and a lot of other economists out there had assumed that the economy would start to roll over. Yes. So they're just, they're not seeing that yet. And it's not, it's not chipping away at excess capacity enough. It's not creating slack. And therefore, it's taking longer for that inflation number to get back down to their target in their projection. Their target for 2024 growth suggests a bit of a slowdown from 2023 at 1.2%. How would you characterize that number? At optimistic, pessimistic? Uh, no, it's, it's pretty realistic. Yeah. I mean, especially considering how the second half is shaping up. I think the handoff into 2024 is going to be a little bit firmer. Uh, and you can get a pretty decent number there, even if the economy starts to trip up a little bit in the, in the first half of the year. Jim? You guys are you guys are living in an alternative universe to what I look at, right? I mean, I mean, I keep hearing the economy strong. Well, okay, last print in GP, GDP was zero. How is that strong? How is that strong? Um, and I, I just I, I just shake my head, right? I mean, so is it, are we going to in two months? If fifty percent of CPI is is by mortgage interest cut, is that going to be high enough? Is that going to be high enough for the Bank of Canada? Pick up on uh, Robert's one, and I know you wanted to. At the end of the break, he was saying this is about risk management. It's not about dealing with the data that is in front of you. The risk is to the upside on inflation, so that's what you have to manage. The second largest economy in the world is in deflation. PPI in this country is that's negative 6.4 percent. There are deflationary pressures all over the place that we are whistling by the graveyard that people are ignoring. So time stamp this for the Bank of Canada, because I'm going to love to see what they say in a couple of months, right? Because if they hammer the housing market, there is nothing in this economy but housing and energy, and energy is not a growth sector. It is I wrong. Just like one last page. Yeah. It is wrong for the Bank of Canada to assume that this economy is the same as the United States, which is a diversified economy. The Bank of Canada is making a massive policy mistake here. The other thing that's different here versus the U.S. is our immigration policy. And population growth is something that the Bank of Canada acknowledged in their statement today, but not just on the demand side, on the supply side as well. How do you think about population growth as it relates to inflation today and in the future? Well, it's, it's a very good question. And my own personal opinion on this has been, you know, the, the, the very elevated immigration targets are positive from a longer term perspective in that they drive labor supply, they absorb inflationary and wage pressure, and they ultimately, you know, as, a, as I said, bring down the, the competition for labor and, and absorb wage pressure. The problem is that it takes a lot of time to integrate a million and a half new Canadians into the labor force. The minute somebody walks into this country, they need a place to live, they need a doctor, they need various day-to-day -day services. So I think the immediate impulse of this is actually inflationary. We see that in rent, we've been seeing it in housing. And so in order to you know, get through the near-term cost of this, it is effectively more inflation, higher interest rates than you otherwise would see. The payoff is three, five, 10, 20 years down the road when we have that, that, that more uh, bountiful source of labor supply, so to speak. We are seeing, uh, you, you know, you're obviously very cautious, Jim, about what this is going to do the, to the economy. On a day where we got a rate hike in Canada, in the U.S., inflation came in below expectations, but we're still pricing in a rate hike in the United States. Risk assets are having a great day. So even at these levels, you're having the S&P hit the highest level since April 2022. This is, um, you know, ahead of earnings where we're still expecting profit to fall. So, so we're still able to 
I guess, generate returns in the market in this environment. You know, I'll put it another way. The markets are not pricing in the severe recession scenario that you're talking about. Well, first off, I went on the record when they raised rates internally, and I said, get out of Canada. Just sell it. Or is everybody going to own Kustard? Right? So they bomb the real estate market. Why you want to own Canadian banks is beyond me. If you're sitting here in the city of London and you're a global macro person, who I talk to, or New York City, they think it's crazy what we're doing up here. They look at the data. So if you look at the smart money, what the smart money is doing, they're, they're, just, they're just data hogs like me. They're just looking at this stuff. And they're not taking what the Bank of Canada says at face value, right? The data is the data. I don't care what TIP I mean, says. Is that, is that the reality of the situation, or is it just that everybody's been piling into tech and we don't have that much uh, of tech? We've got energy and we've got bank stocks, and banks in both sides of the border have been challenged. 37%, that's the biggest misnomer. 37% of the stocks in the S&P 500 beat the S&P. 37, and now it's starting to broaden out. Right, we're going back to old highs. At the beginning of last year, or at the end of last year, I said 4,800 on the S&P 500, right? Everybody thought I was crazy. We're gonna get there, right? And the fact that I'm trying to say is, look, at in a Bank of Canada can say whatever they want, but capital looks at the data. And the data is saying that we are dramatically slowing and inflation is coming down and the risk is deflation. Bank of Canada and the Fed can say whatever they want. Capital moves. And what they're doing is they're positioning themselves for a slow growth deflationary environment. That's what the money's doing. That's what capital is doing. And all I'm trying to do at Wellington as an independent, right, not tied to a bank, is to sit there and say, this is what the data is saying. This is what these folks are saying. Invest accordingly. So that's why now we're sitting there going, what are we doing? We're selling a little bit of the NASDAQ 100, and what are we doing? Mid caps are starting to outperform, right? The bottom third of the S&P 500 is starting to outperform. The NASDAQ 100 was up almost 40% in the first half, and the TSX was up low single digits. That's a fact. That's global capital markets stating and making a statement.